At the time of our last anniversary, we had just beaten the enemy at Peleliu and were making plans for new landing operations. Operations that would pit us against the best and final defenses of the enemy in the Pacific. We, the officers and men of the Marine Corps, knew that we would succeed. But we also knew that the battles ahead would be as hard and as bitter as any in which the Marines had been engaged. So we prepared for those battles. In the years of fighting from Pearl Harbor to Peleliu, we had bypassed many Japanese garrisoned islands. To prepare for the battles to come and to prevent their use as bases against our line of communication, Marine Corps aviation helped keep them neutralized. We blasted their transports to the bottom and their submarines to the top, kept their planes on the ground and their installations in the air. We kept constant police over dozens of sidetracked rat holes in the Solomons and the Carolines, in the Marshalls and the Marianas, feeding them a steady diet of concussion and short rations while we made ready our Sunday punch. However, the Marine Corps could build as well as destroy. On the repatriated American island of Guam, Ravaged by 2,000 Guamanians, loyal American nationals had to be given emergency relief from epidemic, starvation, and exposure. For rebuilding the people was our first step in rebuilding Guam. By 1945, the little salvaged island of Guam was no longer a blueprint. It was well on the way to becoming our strongest fortified outpost future headquarters of the Pacific Fleet and springboard for our next attack. The Marine Corps helped put the Army's B-29s on Guam and the B-29s put Guam only a handful of air hours from Tokyo. But halfway between Guam and Japan was a tiny pork chop of an island. Iwo Jima. As a Japanese air base, it was a menace to our B-29s. To make it an American air base was the mission of the 5th Amphibious Corps, the 3rd, 4th, and 5th Marine Divisions. The fleet poured it on, and we stood off, waiting for the bombardment to lift. Our landing craft went in under direct observation from grim Mount Suribachi, an extinct volcano that commanded the landing area. They could practically read our dog tags coming in but we kept coming. The beach was enfiladed and looked like high tide in hell. The sand was soft, volcanic ash. You could hardly walk on it. It bogged down everything on wheels and even most of the stuff with tracks. But we weren't going very far anyway. We moved off the beach as soon as we could. But from Suribachi, the Japs had us zeroed in anywhere on the island. All we could do with the rock was cut it off and climb it. Aviation helped us by softening it up around the edges. To us, putting the flag on Suribachi meant mostly that the Japs had lost their main observation post. And with the men down around sea level, it meant that the odds would be more even. But there were a couple of airfields to take, and quite a few thousand Japs didn't want us to take them. They were dug in, and we had to dig them out. We used everything in the book, and then threw the book at them. The Japanese were cagey. They didn't waste their strength in suicide tactics, spectacular bonsai charges. They held their ground and died hard. It took us a month to secure Iwo, and the cost was high, but so was the gain. Aviation based here could support all future operations and save more lives than had been lost in the war to date. 
Back at Pearl Harbor, March saw the arrival of the first contingent of women reserves to serve at an overseas outpost. These girls, all volunteers for duty outside the continental limits of the United States, were assigned to replace men eligible for service in the line or for stateside rotation. On April 1st, while Iwo Jima was still cooling off, we got orders to go into Okinawa with the 10th Army. This one was only 400 miles from the Japanese mainland, and the job went to the 3rd Fib Corps, the 1st, 2nd, and 6th Marine Divisions. After Iwo, we expected another hot beach, but Okinawa was like throwing your weight against a door that wasn't locked. There were some snipers and a little rear guard action, but the Japs were apparently pulling us in, setting us up. We knew that, but we had to find them to prove it. The army went south. We cut across the island and went all the way to the north. When the army ran into the main Japanese force in the lower third of Okinawa, we went down there to support them. The Japs had been on Okinawa for 86 years, long enough to dig plenty of holes. They weren't on the island, they were in it. They moved from one fortified ridge to another in a stubborn, well-planned, inch-by-inch defense system. They held us for one month, battering at their main line of defense, trying to break and flank that line. It ran from the main city of Naha straight across the island to the opposite coast. finally broke the line into pockets. But each pocket was a tactical defense area. Often, flame was the only way to reach into the honeycomb of caves and tunnels they had built into the mountains. After we had secured the Marine Corps sector, and that had taken us almost two and a half months, we still had the deadly business of mopping up to do. Usually at this stage, the Japs bared their teeth and defiantly died for their emperor. But on Okinawa, they started to surrender. For the first time in the Pacific, they gave up by the thousands. We were on the very doorstep to Japan, and the enemy was just beginning to recognize defeat. <laughs> 